we have taken a lot of the air out of the balloon, or at least unspiked the punch bowl uh, in the way that um, the Fed has taken out liquidity. We've we've had several rate hikes. Um, inflation is still persistent, but I think we have we have taken out a lot of the excesses, at least in the in the equity markets. That's where I think it gets really exciting for the people who know what they're doing to add a lot of value to clients. For people who have a strong understanding of both valuation and things like the momentum factor, uh, to to pull out leadership as it rotates, can mm -hmm. can you help tactically uh, allocate your clients' assets into the things that are working? Can they can they hold the five names in consumer discretionary that that still have juice in them, right? Which is allowing that sector to continue to outperform the benchmark and cut out all of the garbage and the dead weight that's you know down sixty percent. Welcome to the Market Call Show, where we discuss what's happening in the markets and the impact on your investments. Tune in every Thursday on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Tyler Woods, how are you? I'm doing great, Lewis. It's great to see you, my friend. It's been a long time. It really has been a long time. I miss going to those CMT Association meetings and uh, being in New York, which I understand we're going to have one here real soon. Uh, not too soon. Well, not real soon, but in what, in April? Hey, man, six months passes by really fast. Yes. End of April 2023, we'll be celebrating 50 years on Wall Street for the CMT Association. I kind of wanted to get your feeling a little bit about the markets right now. And, and is there anything that's striking you that seems like a trend that makes sense? Or, you know, what, what are your feelings about the overall stock market, capital markets? So uh, I don't think I have an original thought in my body as it relates to markets. <laughs> Which, That's okay. They don't have to be original. They just have to work. Thank you. <laughs> I, I think, uh, you know, you talk to so many hedge funds who it, it, the more complicated their way of making money, somehow the, the more they should get paid, right? It doesn't have to be complicated. And I think, uh, you know, coming out of the MBA program, 2011, coming to New York City and starting to work for the Market Technicians Association, I didn't understand how markets worked. I understood managerial accounting, I understood corporate finance, I understood how companies worked. But if you want to be a, um, a successful investor, certainly over the long run, you have to be able to look across all asset classes, look at the intermarket uh, approach, and certainly consider multiple time frames. So what I'm what I see in the markets right now are, are, is really what every other technical analyst is seeing in the markets right now, which is um, tell me what your time frame is. Mm. If if somebody's trading 15 minute charts, uh, they're catching some awesome relief rallies, right? The the volatility mm. to the upside when we are in a bear market. Uh, right, history bears out that our best days happen in bear market territory. So, if you have the uh, steel stomach to handle that kind of trading, A plus, good for you. And technical analysis will help you manage risk and be really responsible in all of your exits. Um, I certainly have no appetite for that. Uh, I'm a terrible trader, Lewis. <laughs> I, I get inside my own head before I've even opened the first chart. Uh, the the way that I have been taught is that you just have to react responsibly to what the market is doing, right? So if gold is not working, there's there's signal there, right? It should be working in an inflationary economy. It's not. So what else is, is going on? Um, obviously, uh, the first half of 2022, it was energy versus everything else. And uh, I think it was really simple for, for me and my own you know, personal accounts to, uh, to advance my allocation to the XLE sector or to energy names or uh, even to a little bit of the commodity side. Uh, but you can see the rotation happening and it doesn't, it's not lightning fast. You, it's not like you're going to be completely caught off guard, even at the speed at which markets move right now. But I look every week at the relative performance of the sectors against their benchmark. And you see, you know, from the start of 2022, as early as uh, the first week of January, it, it became much more emphasized on the cyclical sectors over the growth sectors, right? So allocations that I had in information technology and communications and discretionary, uh, those were all trimmed or closed out. And then things like uh, healthcare and energy and staples and utility, those, those have really been the outperformers uh, for the most part this year. 
I got excited the same as everybody else when we saw a dip in the treasury yields in July and we saw uh, some of those growth equity names rebounding fastest, right? Rebounding fastest, not mm-hmm. entering new long-term uptrends, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, we saw a lot of relief because they were so beaten down. And I think what's uh, what's been fascinating to me just in the last two and a half years is seeing the makeup of the investor community change dramatically. Mm. Uh, so when you know when 100 million Americans were sent home from factories and jobs and they were given a federal stimulus check, a lot of them you know just had to feed their kids, but some of them opened trading accounts. And mm. we've got these, you know, no cost uh, online brokerages at like Robinhood and others uh, that that had a place for those people. Uh, you also shut down all college sports and a lot of the the betting infrastructure changed. Mm. And so you had gamblers coming into the stock market. And uh, for in in real time, if you have a hundred million Americans with a thousand dollar trading account. That changes the makeup of the the investment complex. It adds up. (laughs) It adds up. Exactly. (laughs) Who cares about your $1,000 trading account? Nobody. But if there's 100 million of you and you're all on Reddit and you all decide that GameStop and AMC (laughs) are the the place to be, you can really move markets. Uh, And they showed us that they could. And poor Melvin Capital, uh, you know, stepped right in front of that train. Mm. And and so I think we're, we're learning some lessons right now about just how narrow the focus is from a very large swath of retail investors. And you look at the market breadth numbers uh, coming into the end of or second half of 2021, and it's it's like eight names that are driving the entire, I mean, just holding up the index because those mm. folks, they care about their Tesla options. They care about Facebook, Amazon, uh, Netflix, and Google. And that's that's kind of where it ends. So if you start talking to them about uh, Burlington Northern Railways or, uh, you know, <laughs> oil exploration companies or uh, freight shipping, like, yeah, n- not that exciting. I don't I don't really care, but this app is going to totally change the world. So I'm investing mm. here because that's enticing and it's it's cool. It's the Elon Musk effect. What would sure. a 12 year old with billions of dollars do? They'd, they'd you know, send their buddies up in a, in a rocket ship. Um, and that's what has captured a lot of those investors. So I think for me, what I'm seeing in the market right now is is an unwind of a lot of that excess. Mm-hmm. Right? And I'm not seeing anything that everybody else isn't seeing. No, I uh, agree. The, but it feels like we have taken a lot of the air out of the balloon or at least unspiked the punch bowl uh, in the way that um, the Fed has taken out liquidity. We've, we've had several rate hikes. Um, Inflation is still persistent, but I think we have we have taken out a lot of the excesses, at least in the in the equity markets. Um, I think there's still there's still probably more to come. Um, but what what Yuri and Timmer was sharing with us on a recent episode of Fill the Gap is that you know bubbles are are really driven by valuation multiples and things like Apple. Uh, things like companies like Apple, stocks like Apple or Amazon, um, they have a, a pretty well justified um, uh, price performance, and they're you know seven to fifteen percent off their highs. Um, that's not total destruction. That's not the end of everything, as Jeremy Grantham told us. Uh, we're we're not going to see a, you know an apocalyptic event. I think we're we're seeing what's more likely a really choppy range bound market that's drawn out. That's really frustrating, but that mm-hmm. creates opportunities for stock pickers, Lewis. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's where I think it gets really exciting for the people who know what they're doing to add a lot of value to clients for people who have a strong understanding of both valuation and things like the momentum factor uh, to, to pull out leadership as it rotates. Can, mm-hmm. can you help tactically uh, allocate your client's assets into the things that are working. Can they can they hold the five names in consumer discretionary that that still have juice in them, right? Which is allowing that sector to continue to outperform the benchmark and cut out all of the garbage and the dead weight that's you know down sixty percent. Um, mm. And that's that's what a, a really good money manager will do for clients. And I think we're going to see um, maybe less of that self directed or robo advising or you know what I'm just going to. I'm just going to buy and hold. 
Well, if you just bought and hold from <laughs> 2000 to 2010, how much did you make? One thing we know for sure, this is not your parents' economy. I want to make available to you a copy of my book, The Financial Freedom Blueprint, the very first chapter you can download for free. And in that chapter, you'll learn on ways to stay ahead of the herd, how to invest in this crazy environment, and how to make sure your financial plans are on track. So go to pathtorealwealth.com and download your free copy today. Right? Yeah. That, that, I know. That really yeah, worked. yeah. The, the, the buy and hold thing, this is uh, the third time in my career that I've seen the buy and hold index crowd, you know, pound the table and then then give up yep and right now a lot of those people are giving up because they realize that it's painful like when it's going up it's hard to beat an index it's i mean it's very difficult because it's so efficient yep uh, but over the long run on a sharp ratio you know risk adjusted basis yep. having a more disciplined approach is you can get a smoother ride and i think that's what a lot of people really need in order to stay in the game as long-term investors meet financial goals you know in their life Totally. And uh, it's it's very interesting to watch this happening. I agree with you on the, on the unwinding part. I did listen to Jurian, uh, Jurian's yeah. uh, uh, podcast. I thought it was very interesting. Um, his story is interesting, but also, he, you know, talking about like some of the justified value. But he also, I, if I don't, if I remember correctly, he also said that there was, you know, if you look at like the long term valuations, like it's still on the upper end. Mm -hmm. So, but it, but it's probably and a lot of it's driven on inflation and what happens from here, mm -hmm. which nobody really knows a hundred percent. But it appears like they really need to, uh, you know, raise rates more, and you know they're behind the eight ball and have been for a while. But yeah, we'll see how that all pans out. And the good news is, is you don't necessarily have to predict everything, which is one beautiful thing about technical analysis. You could yeah. actually follow what the market is telling you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was, in, and I wanted to hear your opinion about this. I was talking to a person about this concept of fundamental and technicals, like how do you bring it together? And in my mind, I've kind of come to this conclusion that fundamental analysis is a setup and a setup only. Mm -hmm. It gives you the the, the 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 setup for, like, for example, gold is set up for a rally, but it's yep. not it's not ready yet. Yep. Um, you know, what do you think of that way of of applying technical analysis? Uh, did you ever watch the movie The Big Lebowski? I did not. <laughs> okay. I should. <laughs> uh, perhaps the wisest philosophical view on humanity ever written by the uh, Joel and Ethan Cohen, the Cohen brothers of uh, Minnesota, where I grew up. Uh, Walter Sobchak is the foil to Jeff Lebowski. And he's he's just, he's always right. He's so principled. And, you know, he, he just will not... Uh, go with the flow. And Jeff Lebowski, of course, he's the dude, the dude abides. There's no, you know, he, he doesn't care. He just kind of goes with whatever life tosses to him. Critical point in the movie, he says, Walter, you're not wrong. You're just an asshole. And, <laughs> and I think <laughs> and I, I, I'm extending some love and a hug to all of my fundamental colleagues because I believe that all long-term trends are driven by fundamentals. Uh, the, the GDP has to be expanding, not contracting in order to see uh, those big growth trajectories. However, like you said, gold is set up for a rally. It's just not rallying yet. So you're not <laughs> wrong, but if you are throwing all of your money into gold, it kind of makes you an asshole because you're not paying attention to what the market is showing you in real time. And uh, I apologize for the salty language. If we no, need, no. If we need salt to take is okay out. on this podcast. Okay. A, little salt, a little salt is okay. A little, a little if salt. you don't have a little salt, then it tastes horrible. You got to have a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. So, I mean, I think technical analysts make the exact same mistake uh, where, you know, we see something on a chart and uh you know momentum factors look really really great at the top we're, we're seeing things that are you know going parabolic and hopefully if we've got responsible technicians at the helm uh they're also controlling risk and they're using stops and they're they're um going to close out of those positions as soon as that trend changes but mm -hmm. you know when i hear really dogmatic views from either side I don't care what it is. I don't even, you know, I don't care what the company does. Uh, the chart is up. I think there's uh, truth in price, but I think knowing some aspects of why is going to really help you stay out of 
you know, those those momentum traps. And uh, and we don't want to be holding GameStop at the top. Absolutely. Yeah, I was thinking about as you're talking about this, I was thinking about extremes and they can be both up and down. You know, we always think about extremes to the upside and being and getting out, especially since most people most people are long only stock investors. Yeah. Um, But like right now, we've got the opposite potentially happening with currencies where Mm -hmm. uh, foreign currencies are going down and they're at major extremes, like literally all of my indicators are at uh, at the bottom end of every single meaning the strongest downtrend relative mm-hmm. to the US dollar mm-hmm. and and it's been doing that for a while this this concept of managing money where you you want to hold on to your winners and cut your losers short mm-hmm. it's really important to do that because you don't know how far it's going to go yeah. but we're definitely getting ourselves in a situation where everybody knows about it mm-hmm. everybody's talking about it Mm-hmm. And 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 when everybody is, knows about it and everybody's talking about it, almost always there's a massive reversal in it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I'm kind of wondering if that's if we're setting ourselves up for that with currencies. Yep. Um, I have a feeling that that might happen when the stock market actually decides to bottom. Yeah. Or near that area. It may happen before that. Yep. Uh, uh, um, but Talk- we have some extremes on the downside. Literally, the only way to make money. This is an, another interesting thing. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you know who Tom Basso is. Of course. Yeah, uh, one of the uh, turtle traders, correct? Uh, sorry, uh, market wizards. Yeah, he's one of the market wizards. He was on my podcast recently. Yeah. And we, when we were off air, we were talking about the only way to make money has been to be, if you can't short, yep. there has been no way to make money unless you own treasuries. Yeah. Commodities are down. All the stocks are down. Doesn't matter sector, right? They're all moving down. Right. They're all going down. Uh, it's very interesting. Like so, so um, that's why you were saying almost everybody in every time frame is um, frustrated, struggling. and I yeah. think that's because we're predominantly long only uh, in a an, long only investment world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, but that will that will unwind at some point. You don't see this very often. When you do, it's a, it's a big it's a dislocation mm-hmm. scenario. Mm-hmm. Um, and st- we haven't seen it this kind of environment. Well, the seventies are still different than now, you know, because uh, we have, there's, there's some differences, but we, there's some similarities, um, yeah. you know, so it's, it's a very interesting concept about how, you know, you have to have fundamental analysis understanding. You don't have to, but it's nice to, I mean, I know some great traders that don't even touch the fundamentals ever. Totally. Totally. <laughs> you know, and so you don't necessarily have to. And yeah, if you talk to David Harding at Winton Capital and say, you know, what do you, what do you like right now? What do you, what are you uh, leaning into? What do you, <laughs> what are in your holdings? They'll say thousands of securities. I, I don't even know, right? Like that there is that way to be in the markets or Jim Simons or, you know, you name your quant that has, uh, you know, that has a discipline to manage risk and they really don't care what they're buying. In fact, mm-hmm. it's totally agnostic. You know, let me grab whatever number of securities or just flip a coin, whether we buy it or not buy it. And then once it's in our portfolio, they know how to control risk and they can weed out the things that aren't aren't trending. Uh, but for a lot of those shops, they're, you know, or Virtu Financial, they're, they're really market makers. They are Ooh. the specialists of the New York Stock Exchange that were on the floor years ago, and now they're they're simply providing a little bit of liquidity at the margins, and um, and they're the market makers. So, uh, what what end investors need to understand is very different from what those uh, quant shops are doing. And I think for for most human beings, it's a uh, it's a relief to know that you don't have to predict or forecast where the markets are going to be. You can simply use a set of tools to read what's happening, to listen to what the market's churning out for you, and then react responsibly. So right now, <laughs> the investors who are just holding US dollars and they're 100% cash, they're they're winning the game, right? That, yeah. that's, the, that's the only, you know, put the cash under the mattress and just hold <laughs> on to it, um, at least for right now. But I, again, right. I think so many arguments on... Twitter and everywhere else would be resolved if if we just spoke honestly about what our time horizon was. So if we're if we're a day trader and we're saying how can you be so bearish? You know, I just you know made X percent on these uh, intraday moves. Good for mm-hmm. you. That's not what longer term investors are looking at. And if you're an asset allocator for a sovereign wealth fund, um, we haven't we haven't even left trend yet. 
<laughs> as much destruction has been in this market, we're still we're still within the uh, the ten year trend trend line. So, I think time frame matters most of all. I, th I think the last time I saw you in Colorado, weren't we speaking at the University of Denver to some uh, students MBA. of some sort? Yeah, their MBA program. Uh, University of Denver has been a part of the CMT's academic partner program for years, thanks to you. Uh, they teach a, a balanced diet of both fundamentals and technicals. And, uh, so we had a lot of uh, MBA students in that lecture that day. was so shocked and surprised when I was speaking to the grad students there and mm -hmm. how many people were actually just really interested in learning about technicals. Yeah. I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but you know, they have a, a, a big diet of fundamental analysis and For JP sure. Tremblay is, who, you know, JP uh, used to be an employee of ours. Uh, you know, he was teaching a class there uh, on the, it was really the Ryman fund. Yeah. Uh, they, they managed some money there. And um, so I, I came as a guest lecturer m multiple times and in talking to the students there, it was amazing. They just wanted to drop everything fundamental and they wanted to know about risk management, yeah. uh, price targeting, how does technicals really work? What is it? And mm -hmm. and uh, it was amazing how many students would come up afterwards and just and be like, I want to learn more about this. So I think it's great that you're doing yeah. that. Um, you know, it's uh, just another anecdote on the same topic. I, uh, I got to go up to Toronto earlier, well, last winter. I'll be there again next week. Uh, but the Ryerson School, Ted Rogers School of Business, has a, a finance conference for undergraduate and graduate students every January. Yeah, January in Toronto. Uh, it's, a, it's a hot ticket. But all the students who were there, I mean, the, the full day's programming is on DCF statements and valuation metrics and how you uh, put a pitch deck together if you're doing investment banking and, and working on the M&A team. All fundamental, all accounting driven. Most of the students are, uh, you know, in the CPA program, they're getting an accounting degree and uh, maybe thinking about pursuing CFA. We get to this panel discussion and I just ask the students to let me know, how many of you have, a, have your own trading account? Every single hand in the room went up. I said, wow. how, how many of you look at a price chart before you make any trading decisions? Every single hand in the room went up. So when, when I'm talking to these students, they don't really know what they want to do in the financial services industry, but they know that there's a, you know, accounting program and they know that there's this CFA designation. They don't quite know what's covered in there, but they, they know that they need some designation behind their name to get a job. Mm -hmm. And, sure. uh, so that's where the CMT program comes in and, and talking to these students about actually having a career path that's maybe a little more creative or a little better fit to their mathematical mind, uh, I think has been really productive. And we've seen a lot of students coming through our CMT program because of those academic partnerships like we have with the University of Denver. Mm -hmm. And you, you've been, well, you know, I've already introduced you, you know, but you know, your role there has been really big at the CMT <laughs> Association. Uh, and you've been there, what, 11 years or something like that? Over 10 Correct. years. Yeah, over a decade, 11. Yeah, and uh, and I've noticed a lot of changes in the CMT mm -hmm. Association that have been for the positive. Yeah. And I, I wondered from your perspective, since we're talking about CMT uh, right now, what has been some of the biggest kind of transformations you've seen in the CMT Association that's having an impact on the industry? Yeah, uh, honestly, uh, I'm I'm just doing my little part, right? We we have a very long, rich history, fifty years. Uh, I've just been this tail end of what has been a whole lot of really hard work, and uh, certainly I get to have a big role because we have very, very few staff members, uh, and so we all wear a lot of hats. But the transformation for the organization really mirrors that of of Wall Street, and so when you Look back to the late 1960s when this organization got started. Um, it was the end of the go-go years. You had these momentum funds like um, George Size Manhattan Fund. He had Walter Deemer as his chief technician. We had a lot of folks who were up in Boston and uh, working with mutual funds where, you know, anything you bought went up. And then suddenly you get into the 1970s and what is it? Stagflation. You've got hiking interest rates. The uh, Paul Volcker uh, work in the central bank machine. You've got uh, a really terrible recessionary economy that follows. And so all of those market geniuses in the 1960s and the go-go years suddenly had to develop a risk management approach. They had to be much more responsible in their stock picking. They had to understand how, how market regimes shift. And it, 
there are a lot of parallels to where we are at right now. I was and just so going to say that. <laughs> it's, it's uh, it, you know, it's been a really fun ride uh, the last 10 years. And this year, I think 2022 has been largely frustrating to almost every investor of every style, type and time frame. Um, and so when you think about the evolution of, of the markets over that period, going from, you know, hand drawn charts on uh, graph paper and uh, tabulating and calculating all indicators by hand. Now we have 5,000 charts at the palm of our hand. Uh, you can flick through everything with a thumb and apply any indicator and study uh, to your chart. So the advancement of the discipline of technical analysis has largely been driven uh, by members of what was the Market Technicians Association, now the CMT Association. And so you think about you know, folks like Wells Wilder developing the RSI as a momentum oscillator in the 1970s when markets were really range bound and you could pick out these overbought extremes as potential sell signals, a mean reversion strategy and oversold extremes as a as an opportunity to buy in. Um, obviously, the, the work now in applying those tools and understanding how they work differently in different market regimes. And that's really the uh, the business of the CMT Association members now is trying to figure out, you know, how, how do we express these ideas? And we're now in such a frictionless marketplace. You can invest in any market all around the world, uh, commodities, <laughs> uh, bonds, stocks, currencies, and now even cryptocurrencies. I think the world has really opened up. Uh, giving technical analysts uh, just even more leverage to uh, to work with in applying these tools. Mm. It seems like more people are applying the tools openly now than when I first got involved with the CMT. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, you know, the academic world uh, falling on its own uh, um, uh, sort of recommendations after the crash of 29, the SEC came out with these uh, rules that all investment advice had to be based on sound fundamental principles. That was the securities law of 1933. And, you know, academic uh, viewpoints shift very, very slowly. So we've had, mm -hmm. you know, roughly 70 years of, uh, you know, a firm fundamental strictly eliminating all technical work. And then in 2002, the Nobel Prize in economics went to uh, uh, Daniel Kahneman who's not an economist at all, he's no. a cognitive psychologist. <laughs> and suddenly the academic world uh, opened their eyes to the idea of behavioral economics and behavioral finance. And what a lot of these cognitive and behavioral psychologists have been observing are the uh, you know, ingrained human traits that drive irrationality in the marketplace. And what have technical analysts been doing for hundreds of years before the, the crash of 29? We've been observing behavior in markets and finding a visualization tool to capture those price moves and be able to uh, react responsibly when crowds become mad. Uh, yeah, so you're, you're really uh, hitting on something that's striking me because yeah. technical analysts have been observing. So mm -hmm. there's there's kind of two ways of thinking about problems. One is empirical where you're, where you're observing and mm -hmm. then the other would be kind of a theoretical where you're trying to understand uh, what is the relationship? What is the model that describes reality? And mm -hmm. you try to, you know, that model should somehow um, represent reality. Yeah. And uh, technicians have kind of been more from the other side, more, more empirical the entire time. Yeah. So it took a long time for that theoretical mindset to actually kind of marry with the empirical. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, there's always there's always that struggle between empirical and, and uh, theoretical. And yeah. I think you need both. Uh, yep. You know, and I think uh, I just had a conversation uh, with somebody you uh, put me in touch with that was talking a lot about why things move and, you know, what's, uh, you know, it has a CFA background and what, you know, all these things yep. about why things happened. And, you know, I, I if you know my story, I've gone full circle because, you yep. know, I was a, a big time into fundamental, still am, you know, but but I realized the limitations to a pure fundamental strategy. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you, 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 you know, this is this concept of filling the gap, which I think is really brilliant, filling the gap between yeah. valuation and the supply and demand of the securities themselves is the yeah. biggest difference that the CMT, in my opinion, offers to investment firms, regulators to understand broker dealers, exchanges and all that stuff. So I yeah. think that that is something that I, I'm a big promoter of it. I will tell people about it. I have yeah. no problem explaining it because I think it's, it's important to understand the difference between the theory and the actual supply and demand.
yeah. you know, uh, one prime example, and I'm not to, to take the stage too much here, but do it, one, do prime it. one prime example is energy, energy right now. There's all this fundamental analysis that says energy prices should soar. Yep. Right. And they did. They went up a lot. But, you know, we're making money on shorting energy right now. So, yep. well, OK, well, that goes completely against um, and maybe the next big trend is up. Mm -hmm. and many energy uh but but i think just having that practical supply and demand of the underlying instruments is is the biggest advantage yeah and risk management right yeah um so anyway so getting back to uh you know what we uh, like to say lewis uh what, is that technical analysis only works in practice it, it doesn't work in theory <laughs> which is why the academics had such a hard time and I, and I think i'm borrowing that line from a conversation ralph had with Dr. Andrew Lowe at MIT, who is a great empiricist and yes. came, to the, came to the CMT Association for a lot of the data that uh, fueled his work and, and uh, got him started on this path. But that, that concept that uh, you have a model or you have a theory or, or you know, even when I went through the MBA program at, at the Kelly School of Business and IU, um, you were talking about energy. What about gold? That is like the classical textbook. This should definitely work in an inflationary environment. Gold has gone nowhere. And the yeah. holders of gold are just getting more and more frustrated because it's supposed to work. It's supposed to. It should. It ought to. Uh, you know, whatever word you want to put there. Yes. Uh, and the problem I, is. I happen to be short gold right now. Right. And, and, and long so, the currency, you know, yeah. long long the dollar relative to the australian dollar the british pound and all that yeah. so it, it it is it's 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 a hard thing you're you're so right and andrew Lowe, by the way i think was a big help for uh the technical discipline yeah because he, he was he, you know the street cred of being at mit yeah and all that being m married in and uh catherine kaminsky which mm -hmm. who uh i believe worked worked with him in some capacity does now on the uh, Alpha Simplex Fund, uh, which they operate uh, separately out of Cambridge. Uh, but yeah, Kat Katie Kaminsky is an incredible mind. Uh, really well, yeah, we should bring her back on. Uh, she did come out to Denver and spoke to our group uh, downtown. Great. Uh, super, super person and uh, very knowledgeable. Yeah. Uh, but anyhow, so th this is great that we're having this conversation. I, I, I kind of wanted to get your feeling. You know, a lot of people don't think of you as kind of a CMT uh, you know, organizational guy, managing director, but you're also a student of the markets themselves. For sure. I mean, you do track things. So I, you've um, branched out and, and are now a co-founder of a company, Go No Go Charts. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the culmination of that, like the, the infancy of that. How'd that all come about? So uh, in addition to my role at the CMT Association, I uh, became co-founder of this company in January of 2021. Uh, with a very dear friend of mine uh, who worked at Bloomberg for about 16 years. And product developers at Bloomberg are really creative, uh, really bright people. But anything that they create inside the halls of Bloomberg, uh, that intellectual property belongs to one person and one person only. <laughs> um, so in, in 16 years of working with great portfolio managers and research analysts and traders who all used the technical tools on Bloomberg's uh, um, terminal, Alex came to understand that there was a need to simplify charts, meaning technical indicator after technical indicator after technical indicator overlaid on your chart um, creates the same kind of analysis paralysis and it introduces the same behavioral biases that we were just making fun of on the fundamental side. Well, I believe it should do this, all right? Mm. You know, uh, I expect this to happen. If you, if you have too many squiggly lines on your chart, you can basically convince yourself of whatever you want. So mm -hmm. the, the idea was to take all of the most widely backtested, the, the tried and true indicators of market trend and to blend them all in the background. So take the weight of the evidence because we believe you want to have a disciplined checklist. Is it above a rising uh, 20 period and 50 period moving average? Is it, you know, are we are we trading the break of a Bollinger Band? Is Donchian Channel showing us a, a new high or high? Are we seeing, you know, end period momentum improving? What's the rate of change? All of those checklists tell us that a security is in trend and we want to be able to identify trends and capture the meat of the move. So Go No Go Charts was developed as a way for fundamental investors who want a complete technical picture or for 
technicians who need a simpler tool to help uh, guide their trading discipline or to advise clients uh, that those uh, go-no-go -go charts really remove a lot of the subjectivity and the, the extra clutter from what technical analysis can provide. But we keep the weight of the evidence. We just simplify the, uh, the data that's being visualized on screen. Yeah, I think it's great to simplify like that because you're, you know, people do get confused. And I was just, I actually went to the website and kind of looked around and, oh, cool. uh, and looked at some of the things. So you have trend, you have a, you have a few indicators there uh, that keep yeah. you focused on things. Um, maybe you can tell me a little bit about well, the one that I found the most interesting was the volatility squeeze. Yeah. So uh, tell me a little bit about that and what what is that like? How did that? How is that used? So uh, not to go too far down the rabbit hole, right? But for all of you listeners, uh, if you've read about uh, Keltner channels or Bollinger Bands or you know a number of other tools that can show us uh, compressed volatility, so the range of price action uh, squeezes, it gets tighter and tighter. And then when you have a, a break of that volatility squeeze, it means um, you're, you're seeing new control, whether it's bullish or bearish. So... Uh, if we think about a tug of war, right, at market tops and market bottoms, and this is all time frames, you're going to see a, a tug of war happening between bulls and bears. And there isn't really a point of control from either side for a time. You can have high volume, you can have a lot of trading going on, but it, the price action is not moving and we're not seeing a clear momentum in either direction. So when on go to go charts, when we see this prolonged period of neutral momentum, we see compressed volatility on the price panel, uh, that's where this go no go squeeze, it's a little grid that builds right on the bottom panel to tell us that we've got this um, kind of like a coiled spring, right? It's, it's building up more and more tension. And then what we look for is uh, on the momentum oscillator, on a go no go oscillator, if it breaks, to the upside, we see positive momentum coming out of that volatility squeeze, the, the likelihood or the probabilities of price continuing in that upward direction in a go trend uh, is very, very high. We also know that from a volatility squeeze, the, the break in either direction can bring high velocity uh, price moves because right, if, if there's a lot of tension and then everybody moves to one side or the other, uh, you, you see uh, escalating or really decelerating price action uh, following those volatility squeezes. So built on the same kind of ideas like a Keltner channel or a Bollinger Band, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, using- But it's using simpler to easier to, to read and visualize. And yes. I think that's, that's something yeah. that's really interesting about what you're doing there is that you're making it easier to see. And then you're also combining in the same indicator, multiple uh, understandings of that indicator by changing the color of it, Mm -hmm. um, maybe by putting little, um, I guess you call them icons that yep. can, that you can add to it. And then, but you, but you're still focusing your primary attention on the price correct, in the chart, which is really important. Yeah. I think because then you're not, you're, you can look at the price and you can look, you know, do whatever it is that you do with price. If you're that type of a technician, but you yep. also got the quantitative background that says, okay, based on you know, higher probability of understanding the trend, these composite indicators say, okay, this trend is up, this trend is down. Yeah. This is, this is lower volatility. This is, this is higher volatility. And that helps you see it quicker. And then you're not trying to ascertain that visually on your own, that you're using technology to help you see it more consistently. And yeah. I think that's the biggest thing is seeing it more consistently. Yeah. Um, consistency is so important in terms of how you do your process. Yeah. Uh, because then you understand the nuances if you're, if you're consistent, if you're always doing things by, you know, you know, which way is the wind blowing like this? <laughs> and you know, I'm a big quant fanatic. I don't know if you totally, know that. Or not. Totally. totally. Um, I mean, most of what I do is more, more numbers and not necessarily data, data visual, data visualization. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, but, but what you're doing is you're doing both. You're, you're taking that quant and then you're making it visual, which I think is great. That, that that's yeah. a, that's a, that's a great way of, uh, it adds value and it can make people make better decisions if, if, uh, they use it correctly. So I thought yeah. that was cool that you, that you're doing that right now. And I saw that you have it on multiple platforms now you have it on. Yeah. Uh, 
It's been uh, it's been a wild ride, Lewis. Um, so launched January of 2021, and uh, there are about eight platforms now. So stock charts, trading view, wealth charts, meta stock, uh, and then we've got uh, a whole bunch in the wings. We're also on uh, Trend Spider and Trade Ideas. Uh, Chart IQ is implementing the tools. Uh, they've got the first first indicator out there on their uh, 8.8 release. But uh, Chart IQ is the engine behind. Yahoo Finance and E Trade and all sorts of others. Wow. Um, so it's been a it's been an exciting run uh, to to be able to bring technical analysis to a very large audience. Right? We talked about how the markets have changed so much since 2020. A lot of those people, you know, the, the TikTok traders. Like, oh well, I buy it when the line is going up, and then I just <laughs> sell it when the line stops going up. Like. <laughs> That's actually not wrong. That's yeah, like a really good momentum strategy, uh, good discipline. If they can, if they can execute. The problem is when you when you implement your trading strategy, can you be disciplined enough to stick with the rules? That's really where the the juice is, right? If you're looking at the expectancy formula, are you able to stick with the trend? Be patient enough to not drop out uh, too early. Are you able to be very disciplined in cutting those uh, losers short um, as quickly as you can identify them? So the tools help people stay much more disciplined because you're not introducing that complexity. It's the whole picture, trend, momentum, volume, and volatility, but all in a very, very simple chart. So they get the whole picture, but hopefully they can stick to their rules better because there's, uh, there's just a very clear signal on the chart. That's interesting. That's, that's great. You know, um, Years ago, I wrote I wrote about this concept. I call it TORQ, T O R Q, trend yeah. relative performance in the context of stocks. Trend yeah. relative performance, overbought, oversold, and quality patterns. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, one thing that's not in there is the patterns. Now that that's something that is always you have two side two camps. Like some people say, the patterns you can't you can't get them to be coded right. You can't you can't test them. You know mm -hmm. you can't. It's hard to and then people will try to test them. And but then there's always some debate about whether or not that was a valid test and yeah. um and and all of that so that's to me that is like the art yep of of technical analysis um yep. it, it like it reminds me same thing with sentiment analysis it's, that's the art it's, it reminds me of like if you're a fundamental analyst uh if you're assessing the quality of the management or if you're assessing the uh the moat around the business that's the yep. art of fundamental analysis yeah and and you can't put a number on it Correct. Um, the qualitative aspect, right? That's to me, there's, a, there's that part of the technical world. Um, uh, and, and I still believe in that. I rely on it less than, than I do on the quantitative side. Totally. Um, because it's more reliable. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but your tool allows you to use both, both elements of, of technical, the technical world, like the mm -hmm. CMT, um, uh, discipline used to be primarily that qualitative side. Correct. Chart patterns, Edward McGee, yep. and all that. Now it's becoming more and more quant. Can you tell me a little bit about how the CMT program has changed to kind of further develop the quant side of the business? Because yeah. we kind of own that space. Like we were kind of doing that stuff before the quants became like quants. You know? Yeah, I, I you know, it's a different, um, a different label, different name for the exact same uh, tools. And uh, the fact that somebody doesn't believe in technical analysis, but they love the momentum factor. Uh, that, <laughs> that to me just doesn't jive, right? Um, you, you were talking early on about the big drivers for the CMT Association, how much it's changed over the 50 years since inception. And the CMT program, right? The, the uh, candidate body of knowledge, which everyone must master in order to become a CMT charter holder, that's, that's really the living document of our authority on the subject. So when the CMT Association tells the industry, this is what you've got to know to be a CMT charter holder, that, that has to mean something. So uh, if I can take just a minute no. uh, to explain that process, we, we actually have a really robust uh, series of events that, that come together to create both the curriculum as well as the topic weightings, as well as the exam questions. And then we have psychometric evaluation of each exam question to make sure mm. that it's uh, performing fairly. So there, there's a lot that happens behind the scenes, but that curriculum is generated based off of a practice analysis. 
And what that means is you go out to the industry, you talk to hiring managers and heads of trading desks and chief investment officers and directors of research. And you say, what are the knowledge, skills, and abilities that your next hire should have? What are you looking for? What do you need? Um, the last time that we did uh, that survey, and we do this every few years, we got a ton of feedback on not, not just the risk management aspects uh, of, of how to use technical analysis, but also the, the application or implementation. So using more quantitative methodology to look at, you know, it, can an analyst tell me 30, 60 and 90 day returns after X signal happens, whatever your signal is, moving average across, you know, the shorter period moved above that longer period. What are the historical returns? Can you test the signal strength? Um, how about, you know, calculating uh, a long-term sharp ratio on an investment strategy or a model or a factor? Uh, and so there's a lot more statistics and logic in our program now uh, than there was when I first joined. And, and you're right, the, the classic works of Edwards and McGee, if you, if you read them with a behavioral finance lens on, those patterns exist because of investors' reactions to the market itself, to that information, and to the fundamental information uh, coming out of the, the corporations. And I, I think that will always be uh, sort of a bedrock of what mm -hmm. technical analysis can do. Yeah, great. So tell me, uh, is there anything that we've missed? I mean, we've, we've, we're have we coming up on, on time here. Is there anything that you want to talk about that we've missed? Uh, not so... Uh, you know, we definitely mentioned the CMT Association podcast that's called Fill the Gap. Uh, mm -hmm. And so for everybody who's listening to the Market Call Show, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of yours, Lewis, and, and watch uh, watch now, not just listen. But um, if, if people are subscribing to podcasts on Apple Music or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts, uh, make sure to check out the CMT Association's Fill the Gap. The other two things that I would mention uh, are that uh, we, we're coming back into a three-dimensional reality. Uh, I was very excited about the metaverse, but uh, the long-term coronavirus lockdown uh, limited our ability to get together as a community. And so uh, we've got a couple things happening this fall that uh, for anybody in the Toronto area uh, or who has the ability to travel next week on Thursday, October 6th, uh, we'll be in Toronto for a, uh, a market mayhem seminar. Uh, some great sell side analysts, Azan Habib and Javed Mirza from uh, Canaccord and Paradigm, uh, talking about their current market views. And we'll also talk with uh, trend following CTA expert Brennan Basnicki and David Lundgren on uh, sort of the institutional use. Uh, the great Larry Berman of Berman's Call uh, is going to talk about mean reversion and sort of a value based uh, way to use technical analysis. And uh, we'll also hear from Michael Naus on uh, relative strength uh, mm -hmm. and some tactical allocation techniques. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to that event uh, and getting back to, uh, to work with our Canadian uh, colleagues. We've had a, a period of change for the Canadian Society of Technical Analysts. Uh, and I think the outcome is going to be really, really positive for professionals in Canada. We're, we're going to merge our two organizations and, and have a much more direct presence, mm. uh, both with the regulators and the universities and the employers. Uh, we have a lot of advocacy initiatives underway. And um, so the Canada story is very exciting. Mm. And we're driving, uh, driving that point home on Thursday, October 6th with that seminar. Ah, sounds like a good event. And yeah, we'll definitely put on the show notes. Uh, in the show notes, we'll put a link to the Fill Perfect. the Gap podcast. I know Bill Miller was on there. Um, yeah. Dane Faber was on there recently. We mentioned it. Jurian Timmer was also on there. Some great yeah. guests. Uh, yeah. So definitely check that out. Well, in episode one, if you want to go in the way back time machine, um, we had the great privilege and honor of interviewing Robert Farrell who is a uh, chief market strategist for uh, Merrill Lynch for about 50 years. Uh, mm -hmm. Also the first president of the CMT association and just a legendary uh, market analyst. So God, I read a yeah. lot of his research and got a lot of ideas from that, that yeah. pro. He's just amazing. I did listen to that one too. I've listened to all of them. Just so you know, Tyler. <laughs> well, we gotta we gotta find a date and get you on the show, Lewis. There's a lot to talk about. Oh, uh, bring me on anytime, anytime. Yeah. So we'll this has been great, Tyler. It's good to catch up with you. Good to hear what's going on with the CMT. Congrats on the go no go. I wish you the you so best much. on that. And yeah. um and still promoting the discipline of technical analysis, which has expanded into a, a much bigger discipline, actually. 
And uh, thanks for all the work that you've done in that field. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Lewis, we hope to see you in uh, New York for the 50th anniversary next April 26th to the 28th. It'll I am planning be on being there, Ralph, when I was off air. Ralph is like, you have to go. You have, you know, <laughs> if, if he was with me, yeah, he would have. <laughs> right there. Right you've there. got to be there. And he's right. You got to be there. If you're, if you're a member of the CMT Association and you don't go, I don't know. We have to. 50 lashes. We'll have to come up with some. some uh, you better have a good excuse. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All, All right, right Tyler. Lewis, great to see you, my friend. Thanks for Thank having you. me on. I'll talk to you again soon. My pleasure. The information in this podcast is informational and general in nature and does not take into consideration the listener's personal circumstances. Therefore, it is not intended to be a substitute for specific, individualized financial, legal, or tax advice. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a final decision. WealthNet Investments is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where WealthNet Investments and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure.